All right, looks like we got uh, Facebook coming online. YouTube. And we will still sending data to YouTube. So at least we're uh, at least we're doing better there. Mr. Scott, Danny Coyman, Jake Colley. Welcome, welcome. Let's hit live on Instagram. Since Instagram always times out quicker. We are now live on Instagram. Mr. Kendall Manners from Facebook. Welcome. Chris Siemens, good evening. We're connected on Instagram. Looks like uh, YouTube just popped in. Okay, Danny Coyman, glad Facebook back. Yeah, I know. A uh, little, little back to normal here with those server issues last week with uh, Facebook and Instagram. So we're getting a lot of people from Instagram, Mountain Hunter Box, Good Bull Outdoors, The Hunting Student. Hello, everyone. Uh, YouTube, Rich Sampson, good evening. Andy Dansero, how you doing, bud? Raymond Clark Jr. So, okay, getting people kind of jumping in. Um, nice looking hat, Ryan, appreciate that. So, uh, let's see, Sean King from YouTube, Scott Schmid, Charles Buchanan, Hodog80, hello. Uh, Ryan Tilton, you the man, love the podcast, appreciate it, thank you. I wouldn't be able to do this without all of you guys, so thank you for you know, tuning in and giving us a platform to be able to do this. And hopefully, you know, last Friday was the first podcast, um, actual podcast with um, Western in Contours, Western Contours podcast. Um, so hopefully you guys have kind of enjoyed that as another way to kind of get the information from Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. Jack Keithley, good evening. So, um, so tonight we're going to kind of talk about how to navigate the maze with all the other rats looking for the cheese, or another way to put it, is public land hunting and how to deal with other people on public land. There was quite a few of you guys that asked about how to deal with crowds and, and uh, public land. So that's kind of the topic for tonight. So we'll give it a couple more minutes and then... Um, get going probably I know last week with the server problems with Facebook and Instagram uh, we probably will talk about um, well last week was the announcement with uh, Western Contours so so for for those of you that haven't caught it yet so Western Contours on Fridays is going to do a kind of an elk calling Academy feature Friday and what Guy is doing is basically extracting the audio from Wapiti Wednesday Q&As, putting that in podcast format. And the cool thing is, is that goes live at 12.01 a.m. on Fridays, Pacific time. So that way you guys have access to those podcasts for your <laughs> uh, Friday morning commute. Um <laughs> ready to learn Utah the worst for public Bryce Scott just follow my truck Bryce I don't know if that's a good thing to throw out there since you're usually sitting in one of the seats in the truck there mister unless we take your truck to the trailhead so Ron Keeling from California hello welcome so Lena with perpetual wanderer welcome tonight so all right Mr. Ron Thomas hello so uh, was in Utah this past weekend for the International Sportsman's Expo and the regional qualifier for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation World Championships. Had the opportunity to meet several of you in person. Um, great meeting you and thank you so much uh, for all of you guys that walked up and said that you you know love the podcast, you love these live Q and A's, that you're they're very helpful. So that's that's just cool. I I love hearing that from you guys. So. All right, let's jump into it. So, hello everybody. My name is Michael Batiste from Elk Calling Academy, and this is Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. If this is your first time here, welcome. We're honored to have you. 
The way the Wapiti Wednesday Q&A works is we typically start with a subject. Tonight, we're going to talk about public land hunting and kind of how to navigate that maze with everybody else and still find success. The cool thing, since we're live here on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, is each platform gives you guys the opportunity to ask questions as we roll along. And I do my best to answer those questions as we're rolling along. Sometimes can't get through all the questions, so you know we kind of push those on to future episodes. And then some of the information um, is information that I share with our paid academy, academy members, those that are paying for the private lessons or the Patreon page. And very soon that information will be available on an e-course on our website. So no matter which platform you're on, if you're enjoying the content, make sure that you like, subscribe, or follow. So that way you're notified whenever we go live or upload some videos. So, all right. A couple more people jumping in. Greg, good evening. Tom, hello. Jonathan Alexander, how you doing, brother? Mr. Tony Walker. So, uh, from Instagram, Caleb Newton, how you doing? Chair Hunter, welcome, welcome. So, all right, let's jump into it. So, public land, um, that's what a good, good majority of us hunt. It's public land. We don't have access to private. Um, so, we're kind of stuck in that rat race with everybody else looking for the elk looking for the cheese now really just because there's other people out there doesn't mean you can't have a successful hunt and tonight we're going to kind of talk about some things that i've learned over the years and things that i have found from hunting public land and i know a couple of the specific questions were what do you do when there's other people in your area or what do you do when you're working a bull and somebody is trying to you know cut you off well that's public land it's it's going to happen the number one thing that i really found that i really learned and, and it might drive my hunting partners crazy sometimes if i run into anybody i'm going to talk to them whether we're in the truck driving to a trailhead or uh, we're on the mountainside or whatever. And the thing that I found is by talking to people, they have the, the same thought. They have the same idea. They don't want to be crawling all over each other. They don't, you know, they want their space. They want, you know, their chance for success kind of going up. Um, Jonathan Alexander, what are you doing in low population density areas? Yeah, no, the area I was hunting last year was definitely not low population, but, but, so what I found over the years is, you know, just talking to these individuals. But the key thing is, is how you approach. So think about it. If somebody comes up to you already agitated and on guard, how are you going to respond to that? You're immediately going to be on guard. You're immediately going to be on the defensive. So by approaching these individuals and just starting a conversation, um, now, I'm not saying, you know, be an open book. I mean, there's still a lot of times where we're talking to these people and we're like, hey, are you guys seeing anything? And they're like, no, we haven't seen any elk. We haven't heard any elk. How about you guys? And we're like, no, nah, it's, it's pretty quiet. We're not seeing much around here anyway, either. That's not necessarily the truth, but I mean, we're in elk almost every day, so but we don't want to share that information. But really the information that we're doing when we're talking to these people is, you know, I'll ask them, have you hunted here very long? You know, where's your favorite areas? And what you'll find is if it is somebody that has hunted there for a while, in fact, prime example, last year, we were heading up to where this road splits and we were planning on kind of going straight to where it ended and then jumping up on a ridge. Well, when we got to where it splits, there was a guy there that was unloading a motorcycle. And so I just stopped and started chit-chatting with him real quick. Guys hunted there for 20 plus years. He was actually taking the bike to the left fork, which not a big deal. But the fact that we were talking, okay, you're going left. We're going to go straight and hit this ridge. And he immediately went, oh, so you guys are going up there into the old clear cut. We hadn't been into this area. I didn't know what was up there. 
And so as soon as he said, oh, you guys are going up into the clear cut. And I was like, you bet. He goes, God, I know there's always elk up in there. And I'm like, well, why aren't you going there today? He goes, ah, he goes, I heard a bull over here on, on, on the end of this left road down into this um, draw. And I was going to get down there in the meadow and, and follow the creek up. So just by that, I had never, this is when we had just relocated camp. We were still getting to know the area. So just because of that information right there, I knew that the road that goes straight and dead ends, you hit that ridge, it goes up into a clear cut, clear cut that holds elk on a regular basis. And the road to the left, there's a meadow with a creek through it that there's elk living right there too. So just that little conversation told me a little bit more about the landscape. I didn't have to go hike all that to figure all that out. He gave me that information. But because of how started the conversation, he gave me that information. And then we basically went, okay, this is what we're planning on doing. And he's like, oh, nope, we're not going to affect anybody because I'm going to do this loop. So based on that information and being cool, we both knew where each other were. So we knew that we weren't going to be climbing on top of each other. Now, does every encounter on the mountainside go that way? No. You are going to have those individuals that they could care less what you're doing. It's their spot. Their family has hunted there for generations. And it's almost like they hold a deed and title to that area. So no matter what you do with those type of individuals, there's nothing. The other thing that you can do with those individuals is kind of find out how often they go and hunt that area. Oh, we normally come up and hit this spot every three days. Okay, now you immediately know. They're in there today. They're not going to be there for three days. So there's a couple of days that they're not going to be in there. So now you can adjust your schedule. Okay, they're going to be in here today, not tomorrow. So if today's Monday, they're in here Monday, not Tuesday, not Wednesday, but they'll be back Thursday. Hmm. Well, if they were in there on Monday, really trouncing around, maybe we don't want to go in there Tuesday. Hmm. But maybe we'll go in there Wednesday, the day before they come back you still can get some sort of information. So, but like I said, it's how you start that conversation will determine whether the people are going to be friendly, informative, or, defens or defensive. And it's amazing when talking to people that almost in today's society for acceptance, there are a lot of individuals out there that really like to brag about what they're seeing and how successful they're doing and how many bulls that they've heard and where, how many elk that they've gotten into. And, and a lot of times these same individuals will also tell you everywhere that they hunt. Well, you know darn well that they can't be hunting all of those areas on the same day. So you make a mental note of their truck, you know, what type of truck it is, what color it is, what the license plate is, so that you kind of know. The other thing about this too is you also know that if you're heading to one area and you recognize that rig or this or that, you know exactly how that person is. I mean, you don't want to park right behind them and go walking up the same trail behind them. But the tough part is sometimes, like we have one area that we call the doorway. There's three different ways that you can get into that draw. So just because we come in the north end, if somebody comes in from the middle or the south, we're not going to be upset with them. I mean, it's public land. So, but sometimes with that, you can also give education also, meaning you come in on the north side, which is the down thermal side, the downwind side. You have this group that's accessing it from all, you know, from up top and their thermals are blowing down. Well, maybe you guys meet. Well, then you can kind of start talking going, man, have you had much success coming in from up there? 
man, I would I would think with the with the wind blowing down that your scent's coming right off that ridge and right down through here. And God, you know, now that you mention it, we've we see all kinds of sign in here, but every time we drop in, man, there's just there's there's nothing in here. What's it like coming in from the direction that you guys came in? Oh, it's a nightmare. It is it is just chock full of brush. It is thick. I mean, we just we hate it. But it's what we have to do to get the get the wind right. So so these are just some examples of conversations. So um, let's see. I'm already catching a flag from people. Uh, LOL, thou, sh thou shall not lie. It's not that you're lying. You're just withholding information. So how about that? Okay, maybe you are telling a little white lie. Uh, Brad from Facebook. I always ask people where they plan on hunting first and then to tell them where I will go in a polite manner is to have mutual understanding and give each other space usually works for me. No, that is a great approach because like I said, if you didn't have that conversation with them, how are you going to know which direction they're going versus the direction that you're going? I mean, I've even had that sometimes too, where it has been a trailhead that I know that goes up and splits and we were planning on going on one fork. There was a rig there. Oh, hey, where are you guys thinking about hunting today? Oh, uh, we're going to go up and go left. Oh, well, we were thinking about going up and going right. Not a problem. Not going to affect us at all. So go for it. Or if it is heading to a spot that, you know, you were planning on heading to, another thing that I found great, great success in is just saying, hey, Good luck. You got here before us. We don't want to come in and, and you know, trample on top of you. And, and that's just not beneficial for any of us. So, you know what, we're going to we're going to go someplace else. And, uh, you know, good luck to you guys. I've had at times where, you know, they've come back and said, hey, this is the last day that we're hunting. And we're, you know, pulling out. We're, we're done for the year or, you know, we're heading back to town and we won't be back up for two weeks or whatever. So just cause simple conversations, but unfortunately most people, as soon as they see another rig or this or that, they just get mad and defensive. They don't want to talk to anybody. This is bull crap. But if you just stay calm and polite, be polite and you will receive politeness back. Plus, like I said, you can get a lot of information about what's going on. Okay. Westerner from YouTube. I always tell them the 800 pound sow grizz with cubs we ran into 20 minutes ago. I've done the bear track thing before too. So, <laughs> uh, Andy, your podcast kind of turned me into a podcast junkie. I've since listened to all of Western Contours podcast and I'm on, and I'm on episode 34 of Meat Eater. I love it. So, uh, Danny Coyman from Facebook. Uh, people, if I have a spot, I see a truck before me, I go to a different spot. People don't seem to return the favor. No, and I, I remember one year again, or last year again, in this in this new area, uh, there was a gate, and there is a four wheeler trail that goes around it. It's fifty inch or narrower, and you know we were sitting in there in there in the dark waiting for it to get light, and all of a sudden this four wheeler just right by us, and I'm like, what the heck? We're here before them, and and it kind of you know, chaps your backside a little bit that they don't have the common courtesy to stop and talk. And so I saw the next one coming. So I purposely got out of my truck and stood right there in the trail. And, you know, he stopped and he's like, well, where are you guys going? And I said, you know, we were planning on going up here and hunting this face. And he goes, we won't be anywhere near you. We're, we're taking this all the way up. So again, new area. I knew this trail goes all the way up to the top. Now, granted, where they were going, if that actually was where they were going, we weren't going to bother them and they weren't going to bother us. So, but without having that conversation, it's kind of hard to tell. So, uh, K. Grant McCowan, uh, that's public land. Fortunately, it's not first come, first serve. No, a lot of places aren't. But the thing that I found, too, is within these places, by having this conversation, whether it's at the trailhead or I've done this on the mountainside too. Uh, two years ago, working a bull, had somebody roll up over the top. Uh, the bull came in, 
it was a spike. My hunting partner didn't want to shoot the spike. So, you know, we just kind of started playing with those guys that came over the top and started calling. And we eventually went up the hill and talked to them. And it was two dads with their three boys. And they had actually just shot that spike and chit-chatting with them. They had actually rolled up from the backside and they're like, oh, we weren't aware people were hunting this bottom side here. And I said, yeah, there's actually three or four camps down there that, you know, hit these different trails. And well, again, that gave me information that there is access, you know, from the backside. So even though you've hunted an area a little bit, you can learn a little bit more about your area by talking to these people. Also, too, you run into people. Well, which way did you come in? Well, we came in this way. Man, we didn't even know there was access there. We come in from up top here. Okay, hey, let's establish a divide line. We'll come from the bottom and we'll only come up. We won't come past this line. Yeah, great, not a problem. We'll come from the top and we won't go past that line. So you kind of establish these boundaries to where you're not interfering with each other. And it's amazing how that teamwork can, can, can happen. But again, it's how you approach the situation and how you talk to them. So uh, agreed 100% and courtesy and respect go a long way. Yes, it does. So uh, Ron, my wife would want to see those cubs. So Scott from Facebook, I try to talk to everyone. Sometimes if you tell them your plans, they'll try to beat you there. Yeah, and that's why a lot of times... I will let them or coax them into telling me where they're going first. So that way, once they've already established their plan and I'll downplay the area that I'm going into. Yeah. We thought about, you know, going blah, blah, blah. Have you ever hunted that? No, we haven't. Eaten. We haven't. Yeah. We haven't hunted either. Uh, we kind of walked through it a little bit, didn't see much sign, but hey, you know, you never know. Elk are always where you find them. So why not? Okay. Uh, Derek, love your videos, Mike. This will be our first time elk hunting, planning on coming to Idaho. Derek, welcome. Thank you for watching and best of luck on your tr uh, trip. So Brad Lowry, the father you work into the backcountry, the hunters I run into seem to be more like-minded, can usually make mutual agreements. And that's a very true statement. The farther back in you get, meaning the more commitment that you put in to getting back in there, you are more with like-minded people. But you still run into those people too that we've had this camp eight miles back in for 25 years this is our area this is our draw we've hunted this we normally have 15 family members spread out through all here and you know what you guys are just going to have a rough time since you're new or you're this or that or whatever again that's worst case scenario you're going to get that sometimes back in the back country um, we actually had that happen one year um, we were back in seven miles and we had a group of out-of-staters come in and we we were returning uh back to camp after a uh, a morning hunt because back in this area we had some areas that were morning and evening type areas but heading back to camp and here's three four-wheelers that are parked within 60 yards of our camp and so you know made a sandwich and went back over there and waited and two of the guys came back and I'm talking to them and all of a sudden I, I see movement I look down and here's the third guy with an arrow knocked and you know he's stalking and I'm like you know what what is he going to do is he protecting his two buddies I mean I'm sitting here with a sandwich in my hand and and something to drink and anyways so he comes up and I'm talking to the guys and they say yeah we're from out of state and this and that and, and I said okay well I've hunted this for years I said, we have a couple of areas that we really focus on. If you guys are willing to stay out of those areas, I will tell you where there are six different bulls, how to get in on them and how to hunt them. The two guys were very, very appreciative. They said, that's absolutely great. Third guy kind of snickered and said, bull crap, this is public land, I'll hunt wherever I want. Okay, so I didn't give the information to him. That third guy started following us. And in fact, um, 
part of the video that I posted a couple of weeks ago that was in, in the same area that you have to climb up a pretty good face to get up into this little kind of there's there's a series of a couple of sunken bowls up on a on a ridge up there. And this guy followed us up the first ridge and we got up there and, and I told my two hunting partners, just drop down in. I'm going to take the ridge around and drop into the second little basin, which we call desolation basin because you could get in there and get turned around pretty easily. And so I started doing the biggest, baddest, gnarliest bugle I can to get this guy to follow me. He followed me. I dropped down into the base and I heard him from the top and bugle and then he started committing. I went completely quiet, snuck out the back way, linked up with my hunting partners, which now we could work that first basement base and he would never even hear us. We pulled a bull out that day. We're running it out to get it on ice. And on the way back in, I see this guy that was following us in camp in sweats with his feet propped up and so i just pull in hey how's the hunting going he goes man he goes i got into this bull yesterday up top there and he dropped into this basin and man i got i couldn't figure out how to get out of it i ran out of water i cramped up he goes i haven't been able to walk since yesterday afternoon and you know what those guys are going to finish up their hunt today and then we're tearing down camp and getting the heck out of here that's a little extreme but I made an offer. And then what's funny is two days later, another group from out of staters came in. I talked to them. They were very appreciative. They took the information and they harvested two bulls. And uh, on their way out, they came over to camp and uh, basically said, look, we're from Washington. This is where we live. If you ever want to come up and hunt whitetails, here's my number. Give me a call. I will gladly return the favor with the information. So that goes right there. Yeah, karma. I know. But it also goes that, you know, if you're genuine and, and share information, it can be successful for everybody. Um, there are always people like that. I'm a huge believer in karma, karma and the golden rule. What goes around comes around, especially in hunting. Yes, it is. So uh, let's see. Jonathan Alexander, serious question though. Like in the case of the Cascade Range in Oregon, the elk are in smaller micro herds and scattered. How do you approach areas like that with a lower or smaller population density? What's your play on getting the advantage or locating these elk, say numbers like 20 elk in an eight mile square area? Okay, so that's actually the kind of the next subject that I was going to go into. So, okay, so you've got a bull going. All of a sudden you start hearing other bugles coming in from the sides or whatever, other people coming on top of this. A good thing to do is pay attention to what the elk are doing. And what I've seen a lot of times is if you have one little bull here in the middle, well, we don't know if he's little, but you have a bull here in the middle, you're working him, and all of a sudden here's two more coming in. You will hear that bull a lot of times go quiet. I've seen it before where these other people from the sides will basically come in and bugle their way through that area, and it's almost funny because they end up calling in each other. And as soon as they call in each other, man, now they really start second guessing or questioning those other bugles they heard. God, were those actual bulls? Were those people that I heard? Man, just how many people are in here hunting this area? And a couple of things are going to happen. Doug Flutie, I knew that was going to come up eventually. So, you know, and, and what I've seen from this sometimes is those two will turn around and go back out. Now, remember, you were the one that engaged this bull. You were the one that got this bull going. Patience sometimes to let those guys get out of the way, then you can actually re-engage that bull. And he hasn't really gone anywhere. He's just gone silent. And then it's like trying to find 20, 20 elk in an eight square mile area. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. If they're not talking, it's kind of tough to find them sometimes. So that just all goes part of, you know, what we've talked about in the past 
of paying attention to your surroundings, paying attention to what the animals are doing, and paying attention to what the elk are doing. So, Jonathan, really, to answer your question, be different. Think like an elk. Move like an elk. Communicate like an elk. Make sounds like an elk. Don't do the same thing that everybody else is doing. And what is everybody else doing? Bugle, cow call, bugle, cow call, move on, bugle, cow call, bugle, cow call. Get into areas, set up, start doing, um, you know, these blind calling setups that we've talked about. You'll be amazed how effective these blind calling setups are that sometimes in heavily pressured areas, the only response you're getting is raking, maybe maybe just some some low grunts, some low growls, you know, low audible type responses and just flat out coming in. Now, there are going to be those times that you're working a bull and somebody is going to sneak in silently, cut you off, or, you know, they're going to start going and that bull is going to be, you know, responding because it is a really hot bull that has a, you know, hot cow. So, I mean, on those times, you know, that's where you got to make the call. You know, do we put the track shoes on and, and do we put the pressure on? Um, now, depending is, you know, de depending on how many people are in your group, because usually in ours, you know, there's three of us. Sometimes we'll back a trailer out to go kind of cut those other guys off and just say, hey, you know, we were here. And sometimes it's those guys saying, oh, man. We didn't know there was somebody down there. Yeah, you guys are already on that bull. Go for it. Finish it. We're just going to go off. But again, you're going to sometimes run into that individual. It's just like, well, it's public land. I don't care. So there's good and the bad. So um, Grant, so in those scenarios, would spot and stock and going silent be better? Sometimes yes. Or sometimes even what we'll do is if we know that somebody's trying to cut in, We'll have the collar hang back and keep that bull vocal. Have our shooters, you know, you know, basically stock in. But the fact that keeping him vocal allows that shooter to move in. It's a lot tougher for you guys that hunt solo because you don't have that person back there doing that. So, uh, Drake Dog from Instagram. Sounds like my 2018 season had two bulls going for over an hour. Called the bigger bull in three different times inside 15 yards with no shot. Super steep, really thick brush. Uh, third call in, I thought I could get a shot, so I leaned out around a tree while he was rubbing, and the bull seen me and spooked. So still sounds like a great in, in, encounter. So uh, Let's see, Sean King. I've coached people to go into an area and push animals out of the escape routes where I will be waiting. Yeah, and sometimes you can use people to your advantage you know knowing the area well enough knowing that if they go in this and that where's the escape routes where are the elk going to go and then you loop around and get into those areas and be ready to work so jay what about when you go to your spot and your old buddy's truck is there don't understand that if someone has shown me their spot i never go back to it unfortunately that happens a ton jay there's a lot of lazy individuals out there that want quick success and notoriety or just to piggyback on others. It's not really worth it. I mean, you could try to talk to them. If he's willing to do that, I mean, if he knows that it's your spot, you took him in... If he's willing to do that, you know, the good odds are that his level of ethics are just not there. So, uh, I know not directly related, but curious of your approach in this scenario. Okay, Jonathan, that was you following up with the previous question. Uh, there are times where I went in behind guys like the last season, and I know which direction they are going, and I go the other way. Fortunately, this year I killed my bull opening day, and they didn't see anything. So, yeah, that absolutely happens. So, and again, that all comes from um, communicating. So, 
uh, Drake from Instagram. Two other hunters started bugling like crazy 700 yards apart, and this bull was wound up. I figured I was there first, and the bull was responding every time they bugled, but I wouldn't commit to them. Showing someone a honey hole is always a risk. Kind of sucks. Yes, it is. So that's why choosing hunting partners is critical. So uh, I've called in too many hunters. Cracks me up. I've called in my share as well. Most of the times when I call somebody in, they're, they're pretty dang cool about it. So, But a couple of years ago, we had a guy come in that got so mad. He threw his boat. He threw his pack. And... I mean, understandable, because where he committed from to come all the way down to where we were um, was not very easy. And for him to crawl out of that hole was basically not going to be that much fun. But there was five of us, and it probably didn't help that once he committed and kind of came down there, uh, the five of us were sitting on a log eating sandwiches purposely, so that when he came out, he saw the five of us there eating sandwiches. And... I, I knew for a fact because the day before we were up on the upper rim on the opposite side and we heard five or six bulls down in there bugling. Well, now because that guy committed and came down and saw five of us, now you know with every step on the way out, he was questioning those bugles that he heard the day before. Were those actually elk or were those people, especially since I just saw five people? So, uh, to do, had a guy talk about riding his four wheeler down near a stand. My cousin, uh, just to screw with the, screw with his hunt. You're going to run into people like that. The best thing you can do is jot down their information and report them to fish and game because there are laws, not only harassment of hunt, harassment of wildlife, but there's also hunter harassment laws. And that right there is considered hunter harassment. So take their information, what type of four-wheeler, license plates, vehicles, I mean, all that kind of stuff, report it. So that's really the only thing you can do. So because taking the law into your own hands, you're running the risk of just creating a whole new Hatfields and McCoy situation where you're at. So... Um, I have found most of the time though, your approach to it and, you know, just opening those lines of communication can go a lot, a long way. Uh, Paul, I'm usually deflated running into folks in the back country. Got to change that. So, but you know, as back country hunting becomes more and more popular, you're going to run into people back there. So it is just one of those things. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's one of those things is that the popularity grows, it's, it's just going to happen. So Jack from Facebook, the face thing, the first thing I'm going to do this year, if I run into someone is ask them if they listen to Elk Calling Academy Q and A, <laughs> that way it will save us both time. <laughs> I, I like it. I mean, I ran into a couple of guys last year that were out of staters that actually were Elk Calling Academy listeners. So um, yeah, hopefully they are Elk Calling Academy listeners and followers and they understand the respect aspect. So, <laughs> uh, Scott, last year I rolled up a closed road. I wanted to hunt and a truck was there. I stopped and talked to the guys and then hunted elsewhere. Later they came by camp and told me they were headed out and gave me specific spots where they had seen elk and sure enough, the elk were there. Exactly. That's all. Now, now imagine Scott, imagine on the flip side. Okay, that scenario there, or all of you guys, imagine this. You get to that closed road, and there's a truck there, and you go up as the raging a-hole that, like, you own this place. Do you think those individuals are going to give you that kind of information? No, they're not. Not at all. So by having that conversation, um, it's amazing what you can uncover. If they are not ECA knowledgeable, convert them. There you go. So Jack, if they're uh, um, if they're not ECA followers, just kind of convert them and, and kind of get them over, so that way they understand what you're doing. So, Danny, I get tired of cleaning up people's garbage, haul it in, haul it out. Why top of the mountains? There are always beer cans. Yeah, I mean that that happens. Um, 
I've, I've been there before and, and I mean, unfortunately there's, there's not a whole lot we can do. We can't control the actions of others, but we can certainly control our own actions and how we, how we do those. Uh, had a couple of guys mention seeing a lot of fresh bear sign where we were headed. I said, cool. I have bears that live under my house and we kept it trucking. So yeah, the whole bear thing a lot of times doesn't really work. Um, but sometimes it will. Um, if you throw that out to people that are used to hunting in bear country, it's not even going to phase them. Uh, but if you are talking to people that maybe they're out West for the first time, it's going to kind of light up their senses a little bit. So Paul, so you gave them info in a place and they keep showing up yearly to hunt that spot now. No, actually that group, I had never seen them again after that one year, uh, talking about the group that I shared information with. Yeah, no, they, they never showed up in there again. That area was not a fun place to hunt. A lot of elk. Um, like I said, it's it's seven miles back into our camp number one, eight miles to camp number two. Rugged, rugged country, uh, steep, brushy, gnarly. And if you don't know the trails through that brush, um, you're going to end up in a world of hurt. So, I mean, we've, we've had it before where we've had to get on our hands and knees and crawl for what seemed like a mile just to get through that stuff. Other times we've gone through it and almost had our quivers picked clean of arrows and only had one arrow left. So, um, so no, they never came back in. So, uh, James, good evening. Better late than ever. Darn work got in the way. Yeah, I know. Being responsible and grown up. So, uh, let's see. Drake, uh, knew I had the win and they didn't. So I snuck in and waited for the bull to win them and it worked came right to me and killed it at 10 yards. Frustrating to have two separate parties cork me. Hey, congrats on that. You know, that's another thing too, understanding the thermals. Where are the elk at? Where are they at? Which way are the thermals going? How to position yourself into those escape routes. Because again, if you notice that, remember how I said, think about elk and act like elk. So especially if these people are upwind of the bull, you're on the same level with the bulls, so they are upwind of you as well. So by using that, reacting like an elk, it's going to put you into those escape routes of the actual elk. And that's where you switch to those low audible tones. So by switching to those low audible tones, you're basically an elk that's kind of moving out, rolling away from that danger that you're, you're smelling because that's what that other bull is going to do too. So, Okay, uh, if I roll up on a campsite with guys that give the impression of not cleaning up after themselves, I snap the license plate, it's paid off before. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that we can, we can do, so... Uh, Mike Thompson, I just said the same thing on a podcast. Yeah, been there. Bugling a few hunters. Had dudes that don't care. Yeah, we're all going to run into... We're all going to run into people that just don't care. So, ah, do you use wind checker during rifle season? I use wind checker constantly. It doesn't matter if I'm archery hunting or rifle hunting. So, um... I'm not sure where this came from. Rick Tilton, don't introduce your buddy to your sister. Oh, okay. Uh, Matt, when you hear a bugle, it's hard not to check it out, whomever or what is making them. No, and sometimes there are times, and we've talked about this on past episodes, where you hear a bugle and you're not really sure because because of the distance, all you, all you can hear is that top note. Well, obviously, you're going to start moving that direction a little bit until you can get close enough that you can hear that bottom end and really make that distinction bull or person. So, so yeah, every bugle you need to check out unless you know immediately that it's a person. So... <laughs> um, Make your owner bot. I, I buy. I, I use the uh, dead down wind 
wind checker. Have you ever tried milkweed instead of powder? Incredible at showing thermals. I have not. I know there's there's another new wind checker out right now um, that I've kind of been researching a little bit. I can't even remember the name of it right now, but it it's not the typical puff. It is a battery operated, but the cool thing is, is it does have some lights on top of it. The tricky thing from what I'm reading, it's a two button system that you kind of have to do it right to get that steady, steady smoke, but it also has LED lights up that basically one of the four lights will light up to let you know what the wind, which direction the wind is coming from. Not that you really need that. So I don't know. Uh, to do, to do, there we go. Cirrus mountain hunter box. Yes, that is it. So Cirrus C I R R U S. So I like this. You guys sounds like 27 sounds like coastal units in Oregon. So milkweed will stay in the air for several hundred yards from tree stand. Yeah. And, and I've tried other things. I've tried little pieces of, uh, you know, there was wind detectors a few years ago that you just pull it out and it's a little tuft of, of cotton almost that, that, that floats. I mean, I've, I've tried a lot of things over the years. Um, I just religiously just keep going back to the dead down wind. It works well for me. Um, I don't know. Uh, Westner, do you ever cut trails in favorite spots? Yes. Sometimes we will, but the thing is, is whenever we are going to cut trails, we never do it from the very start, especially if it's really, really brushy. We're going to fight our way through that brush a good 60, 70 yards in, maybe sometimes 100 yards before we start cutting the trail. Because a lot of people will start going through that brush and about the 50 yard mark, they're like, forget this. This is way too thick. We're not going in this. We're turning around and going someplace else. So... So yeah, sometimes we will cut trails. Uh, I was out hunting opening weekend and had a bunch of hounds come through chasing bears. I was a bit perturbed. A while later, the houndsman came through and stopped to talk. I was polite and civil, remembering his public land. He told me where he had heard elk calling the evening before. I decided to try that spot a few days later and it's now my honey hole. Shot my first elk there. Nice. Yes. With hound hunters, you will have those areas in states that are legal to run hounds that can come running through your setup and scatter the elk. All is not lost. So just remember when those hounds are coming through, the herd's usually scattering. It's not like they're just getting in single file and going out, they're scattering. If you can pay mental note on direction of sounds that you're hearing. Just sit down, let the dogs go through. Don't move, keep focusing on the directions where you heard sounds. Wait 30 minutes or so for everything to calm back down. Stand up, start working those one of those directions and start doing a lost calf. All of a sudden you'll hear a cow mew or the bull may crack off and bugle because they want to regather up too. You, you could hear the cow do a, um, a regathering mew, an assembly mew. Uh, the bull could do a roundup bugle to call a, each other in. So, so just because they come through that area doesn't mean you need to just go, well, we're done, and off you go. No, just let things calm back down. So uh slinging sticks i have always hunted general season archery public land it's very difficult but can be very rewarding every season has a new learning curve constantly learning so um it's it's an constant evolution so thistle do outdoors i'm from wisconsin i have actually had bears living under my house they do hibernate there nice wind checker you say yes uh I think written code of ethics should be taught and followed. Glad we have so many ethical and good hunters. Just hate to have those run-ins with butt heads on my most important vacation ever. Is it September yet? The New Mexico deadline to apply was tonight. Now the waiting game. God, please give me and the wife an elk tag this year. So, yeah, I mean, the ethics thing. So here's the thing that you guys need to understand also. There are a lot of people that are new to archery hunting, that are new to elk hunting, that come from a non-hunting family. They haven't had that tutelage. They haven't had that individual there 
teaching them. So they don't really understand hunter's ethics. So, and that's really the time that, you know, showing them the ethics can turn those individuals around. Not always the case, but it can. So, all right, you guys, I just use smoke in a bottle. Smoke in a bottle is good. Chalk line. I grew up licking a finger to check the wind. Powder is a lot easier. Yeah, look at the finger can't uh, always be dedicated. I mean, I've used, you know, picked up dirt sometimes, picked up leaves. I mean, all, all kinds of different things. So, uh, lazy and unethical folks steal cameras. They want your data on the SD card. So, yes, that does happen a lot. Round, J. Colley, Roundup Bugle. Let's hear it, boss. Okay. So a roundup bugle is, is basically, if you hear this sound, this bull is basically gathering up his cows. They're, they're getting ready to leave. So, and it starts with a soft bark, a short bugle, and only two or three chuckles. So, and it sounds something like this. And that's it. That is a roundup bugle that the bull, it always starts with that, that soft grunt or that soft bark. That's, that's basically that soft bark kind of snaps the cow's attention and going, okay, you know, we, we, we need to pay attention to the rest of what he's getting ready to say here. So, so keep that in mind if you hear that. So, uh, to do, to do, okay. Can you get a point in New Mexico if you apply tonight? No points in New Mexico. Uh, bugle me this Hobby Lobby clear plastic bottles cheap fill with cornstarch bada bing homemade wind checker have, have tried all that stuff um, the thing that I found with cornstarch is if you get quite a bit of moisture in the air or you have high humidity sometimes that cornstarch can absorb the moisture from the air and clump up a little bit so but since it is fairly inexpensive, if that does happen and you have a couple of different bottles, you can trade them out or whatever or replace the cornstarch. So um, there's, there's a lot of different things out there that, that you could try. The only reason some of these manufactured wind checkers work effectively is because they don't absorb that humidity. So, all right. So we've got a few minutes left. Last round for questions. Throw them in. Uh, I do have a video for this Friday. It is the um, review of the Elk Addicts Rip It Reads, uh, the 450 and the Deuce. So that will go Friday. As far as the Patreon page, we're about five patrons away from drawing that ready to grow bundle. I know um, I'm anxious to give that away. I know Donnie is anxious to give it away. So we are extremely close from giving that first giveaway. And, and remember, that's about a $160 package uh, that will be given away to one random winner. Next week on Thursdays, we are going to start the live Q&A sessions for the Patreon members. So um, probably going to be about the same time, about 7.30. So, um, so all you Patreon members, make sure that you're checking your inbox on there um, just so that you get access to the link for all that. So, all right. Uh, did you ever shoot triax to compare verdicts and traverse? No, I am going to try to get in um, this weekend, and I'm I'm going to try to shoot the triax, the uh, expedition mako, and the obsession. That's my plan this weekend is to go shoot those three bows because it's supposed to be raining on um, Saturday. So uh, get you some Patreon. It's cheap and worth it. I like you. I like it. No whammies, no whammies. I could use the package. Uh, do you have a video with different sounds like the one you demonstrated tonight? Keith, I do. It's on the Patreon page. Um, and that's just Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. There are some links since you're on the Facebook page. 
uh, there's a link right there on the Facebook page that will take you to another page. Just click on the Patreon once you're there and that will take you in there. And yeah, there's, there's cow vocals, there's bull vocals. Um, next week I am uploading, um, the breeding sequence and how I incorporate all of these sounds into, you know, what I do out there in the field. So, all right, Instagram, man, I work every Thursday night. Hey, don't worry about it. Patreon, you'll, you'll still have access to it. Uh, if you call a bull in and he hangs up momentarily in, let's say, 60 yards, is there a call you would use that would make his eyes roll back and come on in? There, there's not necessarily a call that would make his eyes roll back and, and make him come in. It's more so what why did he hang up at that distance? And usually it's a couple of different things. Is one, he got to the point that he thinks he should be able to see that elk that's making the noise. And he's just going to stand there and look with his eyes for a while. If he can't see it, then he's going to start looping around to try to get your wind. Two, there's something that he doesn't want to cross. Whether it's, you know, some blowdown, some brush, something. Or three, he may have cows with him and he has reached his max distance that he wants to go away from those cows and he's not willing to go any farther. So really it just needs to be, hmm, um, what's making him hang up? So uh, Benito, interested in over-the-counter archery bull in Colorado. Is it worth dealing with all the other hunters? Is it even that bad? Uh, bugle me this. It's hit or miss. Muzzleloader coincides mid-September. Um, I've done over-the-counter in Colorado. Yes, we ran into quite a few people, but we also got into areas where we got away from people and we got into a lot of elk. So I think Bugle Me This saying that it is hit and miss is a great um, explanation. So uh, James Kuhn, explain Patreon. Okay, so what Patreon is, is it's a monthly membership. Um, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month, fifteen dollars a month. The fifteen dollar a month herd bull gets you some herd bull only specific calling videos that is the same information that I teach in the one on one lessons. It also gives you discounts on Elk Calling Academy Peril, it gets you discounts with our partners, and we have these giveaways that right now, once we reach 50. Uh, we're giving away um, the Ready to Grow bundle from Rich Ready Nutrients. Once we reach 100, we're giving away a initial ascent pack. Um, 200, we're giving away a Scree Gear camouflage package. 400, we're giving away a hunting bow where the name that we draw gets to choose any hunting bow on the market. That's what you get. 500 members, we're drawing one lucky person and they are winning a Backcountry e-bike 750. And these are, these are annual giveaways. So once we reach these milestones, they all of a sudden turn into annual giveaways. My goal is to have one giveaway like that a month. Now, I know a lot of you don't want to pay monthly. You want to pay annually. So that's why we're building the website. That once the website is up with the e-course on there, the pool for drawings will come from the e-course members and the Patreon members. So there are some advantages to those things. So uh, how many members are there now? We were sitting at 45 when I looked earlier today. I didn't look before I jumped on. So uh, let's see, to do only able to get out to scout to my hunting areas once a year, when would you recommend? Postseason spring or a few weeks before? If you can only go out one time, I would say a little closer to the season is a little better. So, because then when you're out there, start looking for those cows and calves. So, all right, guys, I just got the two minute countdown timer. So we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here, which means we're approaching that hour mark. Once again, I appreciate each and every one of you. So James Kuhn, so where do we sign up? Um, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Elk Calling Academy. Or just do a Google search in, in the address bar. Just type in elkcallingacademy.com and that will take you right to it. And then everything is all right there. Appreciate each and every one of you guys tuning in. So 
Really, really appreciate the support. So have a great week, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. As always, keep calling, keep practicing, but most importantly, have fun, guys. Have a great week, and we'll see you guys next week on the next episode of Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. Good night, everybody.